Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hastings Center event toward navigating danger and promise together, editing the human genome. This discussion will focus on the outcomes and next steps from the just concluded third international summit on human genome editing. Although you will not be audible or visible throughout, we really encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. This event is being recorded and it will be available later today on the Hastings Center website for viewing with closed captioning and other additional accessibility features. It is now my pleasure to introduce Josephine Johnston, a senior research scholar at the Hastings Center and a lecturer at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand. Thank you, Danny. It's really a great pleasure to be able to bring this um, panel discussion or this these uh, guests to um, to this webinar today for the Hastings Centre. Um, I'm going to say a little bit in advance about um, the summit and kind of um, some of the background leading up to it, and then I will introduce uh, two um, featured panelists and um, ask them to share some reflections, and then we'll move into a discussion and um, audience Q&A. And as Danny said, there's absolutely time um, in the program for you as an audience member to put a question in for us. So we really look forward to that part of the discussion. So um, as you know, many people will obviously know this, but just to kind of remind us all a little bit, um, there have been um, technologies and tools for editing um, uh, genomes, for doing genetic engineering around for quite a long time. But in 2012, a much um, improved uh, technology for doing that called the CRISPR-Cas9 system was um, uh, uh, shown to be able to edit um, pretty much any kind of DNA in any type of cell. And that was a really huge step forward for um, genome um, in engineering and genome editing. Um, so this technology was based, uh, it's from a bacter it's bacterial immune system technology, something that um, bacteria use to fight off viruses. And um, in 2012, it, um, publications showed that it could be used to edit DNA in any kind of cell. And that was immediately obvious that that would be a really helpful tool for use in non-human and, of course, also human cells. It wasn't, as I said, the first technology to enable genetic engineering, but it was... Um, uh, orders of magnitude more efficient and quick overall than existing technologies and it immediately changed the day-to-day -day work of many scientists, mostly in ways that are likely of very little public interest, but it also proposed the possibility of realizing really a dream or a, uh, of uh, human genetics and the Human Genome Project, which was not just to identify genes that cause disease in humans, but to actually be able to alter them in ways that could eradicate genetic disease. So in April 2015, there was a paper in Science by 18 scientists and bioethicists led by David Baltimore and featuring um, Jennifer Doudna, one of the uh, people who discovered CRISPR-Cas9 system, um, identifying the huge potential of the system to um, uh, enable modification of human, human genomes but oh, and non-human, but also raising a series of ethical issues, what the paper called unknown risks to human health and well-being. And among other protections, this, the paper called for essentially summits of the kind that we have um, just had. Um, they called for, um, the, they identified the need to convene a globally representative group of developers and users of human engineer, genome engineering technology and experts in genetics, law and bioethics, as well as members of the scientific community, the public and relevant government agencies and interest groups. So they really called for something just like what happened. And indeed, that paper was published in April and already in December 2015 in Washington, D.C., there was the first international summit on human genome editing. Among other things, that summit came out quite forcefully against heritable genome editing, which would be using this technology to make changes that could be passed on in one, from one generation to another in humans. Um, so they came out forcefully against that, but were more cautious about non-heritable or so-called somatic applications. So using the technology and people who already exist to make changes that uh, are not intended to be inherited. 
Um, there was, of course, a second summit then in November 2018 in Hong Kong, and that summit was really dominated by news that broke um, in the days before the summit that a scientist had actually already used uh, CRISPR technology to edit the genomes of embryos and then uh, in an attempt to create children who were immune to HIV, and that twins and then another child were actually born from those experiments. So that news absolutely dominated that, and many people in the public would have sort of encountered this debate perhaps for the first time in, in the news in the, um, response to that summit and that, that announcement. So the third and a uh, final of a plans, this planned series of summits just took place in March, um, this March, this month in London. Um, and the focus there was really on somatic editing. So editing um, people who already exist to make changes to um, confer or um, uh, eradicate disease in them or sort of treat disease. There were also a huge emphasis in that summit on what are equity or access concerns. So with these new therapies, how can we make sure that they're available to all who need them and a lot of and some other justice related questions that are attending that. Um, so in order to discuss what just happened and where we might be going from here and what was missing and uh, what else we should be considering, I'm really fortunate to have um, uh, Francoise Bayliss and Ben Hilbert here to discuss this. They're two key voices in the genome editing debate and I'm going to introduce them now and then ask them to each uh, in turn share some of their reflections. So uh, Francoise Bayliss is the author of the book Altered Inheritance, CRISPR and the Ethics of Human Genome Editing which was published in 2019 by Harvard University Press and recently translated into Chinese which seems very important. Um, she is a distinguished research pre professor emerita at Dalhousie University in Canada and was a member of the organizing committee for this third genome editing summit. She was also a member of the WHO's expert advisory committee on developing global standards for governance and oversight of human genome editing. Um, and those standards were released in 2021. And then uh, uh, Jay Benjamin Hilbert is um, the other panelist with us today. He is Associate Professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University. He's trained in Science and Technology Studies, or SDS, with a focus on the history of the modern biomedical and life sciences. He um, does work at the intersection of SDS, bioethics, and political theory. He has a book uh, published in 2017 called Experiments in Democracy, Human Embryo Research and the Politics of Bioethics, obviously really relevant to this debate. Um, and he's co-director of the Global Observatory for Genome Editing, which we'll hear a little bit more about. It's an international group that seeks to expand the range of questions asked at the frontiers of emerging biotechnologies like human genome editing and bring broader perspectives to bear on that conversation. So I'm going to turn over now to Francoise and then Ben um, and I invite them to share some of their thoughts and we'll have a little bit of a conversation and then we will um, uh, move to some of the questions from our um, audience. So Francoise. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for providing me with an opportunity to share some of my thoughts about what happened at the third international summit on genome editing. Um, and I guess the first comment that I want to make, which is uh, concerns the focus of the meeting. And as you've already rightly pointed out, largely the focus was on somatic human genome editing. And I think you saw that clearly in the program. Uh, I would say two thirds of the program was really devoted to this. And also, I think you saw this in the final statement where the bulk of the comments really have to do with that and with a focus on equity and access. So I think that was a purposeful choice um, on the part of the planning committee. And part of the goal there was, in fact, to try to shift a little bit the conversation. The reason for wanting to shift the conversation is to say that, look, we're actually moving into clinical trials now. And we really need to focus on what are the ethical issues right now for research participants and for patients. So I would say to you, I was also a member of the planning committee for the first international summit in 2015. And I think that where somatic human genome editing was concerned, quite frankly, we gave it a pass. You know, the if you go back and you look at that statement, it sort of says, yeah, we know how to do this kind of research. So that's okay, let's just carry on. And then the focus on heritable human genome editing. I'm not persuaded we actually know how to do that kind of research. I think there are some really important questions about trial design, uh, some really important questions about um, equity and access, which are the ones that this uh, meeting focused on. But it's just to say, I think we actually need to go back and examine more carefully some of those ethical issues. Anyhow, so that's the first comment I wanna make. There was a shift. The shift was purposeful. Um, some people are critical about that shift and I'm happy to take questions and, and offer more comments on that. 
The second thing that then that I want to talk about is the other end of the spectrum, the heritable human genome editing. And here for me, it's really important to, um, if you will, layer the various statements from the organizing committee. So in 2015, ultimately what you have, and I have described this as a you know, two-part ethical framework, uh, you have a claim that you can't move forward with heritable human genome editing unless you meet standards of safety and efficacy and broad societal consensus. I've said publicly, isn't that great? What a simple ethics framework. And then I've also said, you know what? It's actually super complicated. Why? Because we actually don't even know what those two things mean. And it's really important to hear that. We don't know what either of them mean and they're both value laden. We don't actually know what the standards of safety and efficacy are or would be. Um, and we ought to interrogate that, you know, safe enough, according to whom? Um, and I think then also broad societal consensus. I mean, we put this notion out there um, and the work that should have been done is to try to unpack that. And instead of unpacking it, quite frankly, my perspective is we've had lots of attempts to massage that. Um, so some people instead talk about broad societal debate. Well, that's very different from broad societal consensus, right? So debate, well, how do you know when the debate's over? I mean, as somebody who's advocating for broad societal consensus, I know when the consensus would be reached, or at least I have a theory about what that would mean. Anyhow, my point is we have this statement, safety and efficacy, broad societal consensus, that's 2015. As you've already said, in 2018, we have the second summit and we have the birth uh, of two uh, babies that are nominally uh, genetically modified. And to me, the interesting thing about that summit is if you actually go back and you look at some of the early video in the early moments, you have David Baltimore and Feng Shang, at least those two for sure, actually citing the 2015 document and saying this is unacceptable, this is irresponsible, you didn't meet the standards of safety and efficacy and broad societal consensus. And within days, that's disappeared. Because within days, we have the statement from the second summit, and it actually calls for a translational pathway forward, like towards such trials. And I find that actually really, to this day, still quite surprising. You actually have this event, which everybody agrees is unacceptable, and your conclusion is, well, we ought to do it better next time. If you look then at the writing or the text for the third international summit, I see that actually as a bit of a pulling back, because what you see is a commitment to ongoing discussion and debate about whether we should go forward with this. And I think that that's important. And I think it's really important because people like myself and also Ben have been saying, I think loudly, um, you don't get to the how question, which is where a lot of energy is focused until you've answered the weather question. Once you know whether you should go ahead, then you can invest a lot of time in the how to. Um, and I think right now we kind of have the cart before the horse. We have a lot of people investing a lot of time and energy into how to do this without having really wanted to bring open uh, a discussion around that. Two other quick points and then I'll pass it off to, to Ben. Um, I think there's a huge issue here around governance and I don't think that this was fully addressed um, at the summit and I regret that for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think that the thing that's really important is there seems to be an assumption on the part of some that um, the only kind of governance we can anticipate in this area is uh, national government, so governance. So at the you know, country level, countries will decide where to go. And yet at the same time, we talk about the problem of forum shopping and you know, the ways in which we imagine illegitimate activities taking place. And yet the assumption is we can't have a treaty, we can't have a international agreements, a declaration, a moratoria. And I understand the reticence on the part of some for that who see these as you know, robust, entrenched, uh, mechanisms and then we don't want to embrace that. But I think we should have a conversation um, about that. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons to do that. And I hope we can come back to that point in the conversation. My last point, and again, this is just putting out thoughts there for people to respond to, um, has to do with language and the language of one and done. Uh, I'm going to still reflect on this some more, but I thought it was very interesting. Up until this point, that phrase one and done at least in my readings, has mostly focused on heritable human genome editing. And the claim has been, why treat individual patients, hopefully successfully, they then go on, reach reproductive age, they reproduce, and they have children with the same genetic disease that they have. Why don't we do a one and done move to heritable human genome editing? At least that's an argument that some people advance. And at this summit, 
I was really struck by the fact that we're now hearing one and done in the context of somatic human genome editing. So why treat this person with a currently available technology, uh, for example, in the context of sickle cell disease, hydroxuria and pain management, et cetera, where when we could do a one and done, which would be the genome editing in a somatic context. So I think for me, that was really striking. And I wanna pay attention to see how that language continues to be used because if people start talking about just one and done, how is it that others will interpret that? Will they interpret that as a defense of somatic genome editing or will they interpret that as a defense of heritable human genome editing? So those are my sort of initial thoughts or comments. Thank you, that's so provocative and interesting. We're already getting questions about some of what you said, so that's fantastic. Ben. So, so thanks so much. Thanks so much, Josie, for having me. Um, okay, so so uh, whereas Francoise has the difficult um, diplomatic role of being both on the inside and standing uh, on the outside as a critic, I have the much simpler job of just being on the outside as a as a critic and and uh, um, you know offering some thoughts on I hope on you know the the very worthy and valuable effort first of all, that the summit represented and also the things that were achieved there, but also some of the gaps. Um, I think that if the promise of these summits is, is to be, well, ultimately delivered upon or even simply still sort of aspired to, we have to be quite mindful of those gaps and, and attentive to them and, and um, you know, sort of take the time to discover them since they're not necessarily self-evident. Um, and I have to say that coming out of this summit, there were many things that were impressive, that were hopeful, that were that were, and the the fact of the summit itself was, uh, you know, it was a very valuable exercise. And yet, at the same time, I was struck by the the quite significant lacunas that were not only present but were just to a large degree unacknowledged. So let me say a little bit about what I mean by those. The idea of the summits, as I understood them, and as was articulated back in 2015 before the first summit, was to seek to draw together an international community, a genuinely international community, to discuss questions of not merely science, but of governance, um, of, of the right and the good, vis-a-vis -vis a technology with the potential to change the fundamental stuff of human life. Um, that's a weighty undertaking, one that inevitably is going to fall short in the sense that it will will never be complete. Um, and yet, at the same time, it's one that takes that requires a kind of serious commitment to a, a rich conversation. I would say an inclusive conversation, one that draws upon the sort of wealth of knowledge and experience represented um, um, within humanity, um, and and thus also the sort of forms of wisdom, because. What's at stake here is not a set of molecular techniques. What's at stake here are ways of making people and making judgments about what sort of people there should be, whether people should be transformed, and then in, in what ways in the name of what imagination of, of, of therapy, treatment, and cure, et cetera. Um, and so, and so uh, in that sense, the summits themselves, though they have had you know, a certain level of attention to governance, and I think Francoise is ex exactly right. There was a sort of insufficient level of attention to governance in this third summit. For example, one of the first things said by, you know, one of the um, uh, representatives of, of I, I believe this was Victor Zhao, um, although I'm not, I can't remember that for sure. But one of the, the um, figures who's you know, leading one of the organizations that convened the summit declared simply that it was impossible to have international agreement um, about, in effect, any of the matters that were under discussion, which is belied by the fact that, well, there is, in fact, an international agreement that much of Europe has been, you know, committed to for several decades. Um, but also a kind of, in, in that sort of declaration, uh, a, a closing the door to possibility that I mean, certainly does seem possible to plenty of the people who are involved in the discussion. But if we think about governance in broader terms, and that's how I would want to think about it, it's less about what are the systems of rules or constraints that are put in place, and more in its sort of entomological sense, it's a, it's a nautical term. It means steering the ship, in effect. So what is steering the ship? 
in what direction, who is at the helm? Those are the questions of governance that we have to ask. And some of the things that I think were under discussed at the summit and yet were also performed in a sense at the summit, maybe unwittingly, are dimensions of governance that warrant really quite serious attention, but are largely neglected. So let me just give a few of these, a few examples of these for, um, for grist for the mill here. So one is what was sort of taken for granted and I very much appreciate what Francoise has said about the need to give attention to somatic genome editing, the notion that this is just a sort of simple matter of curing people and we don't need to talk about it, we just need to get on with it. Yeah, absolutely, that's an absolutely problematic and incomplete approach. And yet, in the discussions that took place, which were to a large degree about equity and access, there was at least to some degree a kind of taken for grantedness of the, of the kind of regime of innovation, including its agenda setting, um, that produce a circumstance where you have really quite remarkable um, and extremely valuable therapeutic interventions that are basically ineffective if the project is to cure the disease. Not because it can't cure an instance of the disease, it can cure an instance of the disease, but it can't cure the disease insofar as it is simply impossible that it could reach the vast majority of people who are affected by it. So the attention to sickle cell disease, which is a, you know, a quite a domain of real achievement in, in uh, biomedical innovation, in a sense, didn't appreciate the extent to which the approach to innovation itself has produced the conditions of inequality that it now seeks to remedy by talking the talk of access, which you can think about it as a, as a resource problem and a distributive problem, or to some degree, and this was touched upon, you can think about it as an innovation problem. But what about a kind of systemic uh, organization of the kind of ecology of innovation and the way in which there are asymmetries in the agenda setting itself? That access is a kind of afterthought rather than a, rather than a, um, a starting point. Okay, so that's one. What what is sort of taken for granted? I think the divisions between innovation and then its social impacts and the need to ensure that those are somehow uh, equitably distributed that that division, in a sense, separates off and renders sovereign unto itself that regime that produces those those inequalities in the first place. Um, the second is the way that problems where problems were seen and i mean of course the foremost example of this was the the so-called crispr babies that you know um that kind of hijacked the the second summit in 2018 where those problems are seen as problems of containment so there was quite a lot of talk about you know what kind of reforms has china undertaken in order to basically make it very clearly illegal to do what was somewhat ambiguous in 2018 little effort to reckon with or learn from um how that how that case unfolded um since if one understands it not as a kind of singular aberration but as in some way connected to a kind of larger setting or milieu, there are questions to ask about that larger setting or, or milieu. But the mode of containment rather than a kind of reckoning and learning, again, goes to towards taking, keeping things still, taking for granted things, not asking deep questions about status quo ways of doing business um, that, you know, are quite, are quite consequential. Um, then, then the third thing is, I mean, one of the things that was really striking and perhaps Francoise, if she can do so without breaking confidence, can comment on this. One of the things that was really striking about the summit was the kind of allocation of real estate, the extensive periods of time that were given to detailed discussion of scientific advances, um, you know, in in somatic gene genome editing, okay, but also in in on the third day, which was dedicated to the more controversial things like germline interventions, you know, we had we had hours of detailed scientific talks of a sort that you would see at the International Society for Stem Cell Research or the, or at, you know, pick your kind of professional scientific meeting where scientists are speaking to each other, um, presented to a, a much more diverse audience that didn't need to have the detailed minutia of the data in order to make sense of the stakes uh, of the kind of experimental work that was being done and the sort of technological possibilities it was pushing towards. And yet, the room for talking about those possibilities was delimited to, you know, remarkably constrained periods of time. Francoise, um, in a in a kind of moment of mutiny, 
stole an entire half hour coffee break in order to give it to a discussion of heritable genome editing sort of ethics and governance um, that was squeezed into a, you know, a, a very, very tiny period of time. I was genuinely perplexed by that structure, by that agenda, and the way that it, it uh, precluded expansive conversation by focusing down on the weeds of the how and setting aside, or at least pushing to the margins, the question of whether. And, you know, I guess what I would say about that is whether this was intended or not, the agenda itself sort of spoke a foregone conclusion. And that is that science marches on, that the work is being done and shall be done. And what the work means, well, that's a question that you can nod to by saying the conversation hasn't yet concluded the conversation needs to be ongoing. But if in a context like the summit, significant room isn't given for such conversation, well, there's a significant opportunity cost associated with that, even as there's a kind of declaration that that conversation necessarily will and should be a kind of reactive conversation um, that doesn't ask the, about the ways in which the fact that the work is being done itself speaks priorities and commits to a kind of orientation vis-a-vis -vis governance um, in which uh, the science speaks first uh, and the rest of us have to find ways to speak later. Um, I'm gonna quit there. I'll say something about the observatory if you want me to, um, but, but uh, um, let me just leave it there it. for now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, you both put so much on the table. So um, maybe I'll just say um, a few little things and then ask a question. But um, I just wanted to our, our um, audience to understand that they can go and see um, the videos of the entire three-day summit and the program is all on um, the Royal Society. That's the UK Royal Society's website. So you can catch up or um, in addition to all the news stories about, about it. Um, and I do want us to talk a little bit about heritable genome editing and the He He Jing Kuei kind of um, sort of repercussions and some of that. But but I, can I first maybe ask us to say a little bit, just talk a little bit about what was probably a really memorable part of the summit for many attendees, which is the presentation by a patient, a sickle cell patient from the United States who's received um, gene editing, you know, somatic editing therapy, and and has and she really testified both to the um, sort of devastating nature of the disease throughout her lifetime, including when she was a child, which I thought was quite moving, and then about sort of the transformation. And, and as we noted, like the second half of the first day was really all about sickle cell disease as this kind of key case study. Um, and then one of the things, many things that's notable about sickle cell disease is that it's um, a disease that affects, I think, it, you know, over half the people with the disease, maybe more, are in... Um, Africa or in India, um, you know, even in the United States, as many of us know, it's extremely hard to get access to, um, you know, healthcare is not equitably um, distributed. So um, I thought her case was really moving and really exciting, and I'm sure quite impactful in the room, I would imagine. I wasn't actually there in London, but um, but also she raised, you know, raised this huge question of just like, how are these million dollar therapies ever going to be available to the people that need it? And like Ben was saying, that's sort of like the end question, um, uh, like, oh, we've made this thing now, you know, whoa, what can we do about how to get, get it to the people who need it? So I would love to hear you talk a little, um, each of you reflect a little bit on that, that case and that, and that, that question. And it's, it's sometimes called a new question for gene editing, but it was always, a huge question, I think, which is a kind of looming of like, well, we do these things. Why would they be any more available than any other high tech therapy, which is just not available to people? So I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit. So let me offer a couple of uh, comments. So one of them is to say that, uh, at least in terms of my participation uh, as a member of the organizing committee for this event, I was really concerned that we not repeat what had happened previously, which was to sort of um, you know, have a number of patient organizations come up and say why it's really important that their particular um, disease be the focus of somatic genome editing. And one would imagine that the rhetoric would all be the same. We need to do this. It's really important, et cetera. So in conversations, I had made two points in terms of what could be an alternative to that, which is one is to recognize that um, 
there are a number of sort of civil society organizations and that they are not the same as patient organizations and could we make space for them in the program? And there was an effort um, to respond to that request on my part. And I think we saw that in the program. I would agree wholeheartedly, uh, not enough time given to that, at least in terms of how important I think it was. Um, I can only say that I asked for more time and you can look at the program. Um, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that um, I thought it was really important to have um, patients that had actually either participated in research or chosen not to participate in research. And that's actually what we set out to do. Could we get testimonials from someone who said, look, I made the decision to become part of the scientific endeavor to contribute to knowledge production in the hope that maybe I would also get some personal benefits. And you know, what is it that they would say about that experience? And could we also find a patient from a similar um, you know, perspective, but who would say, and I made the decision not to participate. So that was the goal um, around that. And I think, you know, uh, in some ways, I think we succeeded in, in terms of meeting those objectives. And in other ways, you know, I can find fault too. But I think it's important to say that that was a, a different kind of effort that was made. So I think that's really, from my point of view, still a success. Um, and I think we do need to hear from patients. Now, as to the issue of pricing, I feel very strongly about this. I think what we have and have had for a long time, not just in this case, is catastrophic pricing, right? It just makes no sense at all. But I would contest the idea that our attention to this is something that comes at the end of the process, like, oh my gosh, look, we've made these wonderful therapists. Oh, look at that, we have a problem, costs a million dollars. Um, I think if you commit to the idea that these interventions ought to be accessible to large swaths of the population, you then do your science differently. You don't think about this as personalized medicine. You think about how can we design templates? That's just one kind of very simple example. So I think it is really important to ask this question now and to ask it loudly, right? How are you going to change the way you do your science so that it will be accessible? And we're starting to hear a little bit about that in terms of the difference between ex vivo or in vivo kinds of interventions. And there's other things that possibly could get on the table if people really thought about this seriously. But in response to your last comment, Josie, this is like of fractional importance relative to the fact that too many people on this planet do not have access to basic health care. And I think it is a problem of capitalism. And, you know, I think we have to name it here, we have to name it elsewhere. It's just that this is really reaching the most ridiculous kinds of sums of money in a context where since the 19, since 1948, Actually, if we think back to uh, the Declaration on Human Rights, we've said that everyone has the right to benefit from the advances made in science. And here we have an example where not possible. And you could say it's not been possible for a long time. I would agree with you. I hope we can start actually seriously looking at it. This is catastrophic pricing and it makes no sense. Ben, did Let you me... want to add anything to that? <laughs> yeah, Thank let me you. just... Let me just agree wholeheartedly with with uh, Francoise about the catastrophic pricing and also about the way that this is not an end of pipeline problem, but a design of pipeline problem. It is a, it is what the what the um, translational aspirations are of the pipeline and who who the pipeline is oriented towards, right? And I think it's it is correct that it's not an end of pipeline problem, ethically speaking, in that sense. I mean, what are our priorities? But also in the sense that that those who are undertaking innovation are fully aware of the sort of steps that they're moving through and what lies at the end of the pipeline and thinking strategically about how to capture um, the the promise of pricing of this sort. And you know, I mean, if you are a a biotech company that has, you know, five to 10 years of funding, you have your burn rate, you want to get a therapy out, you want to make money on the therapy, you're, you're looking at, you know, what, what are the, what's the profile of the sort of, um, you know, total costs that, that, you know, health, healthcare systems are needing to absorb what drugs are going off patent and going generic such that there's going to be surplus, which might be captured, which by the way, is precisely the strategic thinking that the sort of um, first in class companies that are working in this domain are, are thinking, I mean, they're, they, this is going to be a real pricing problem down the line, but actually it's going to come out in the wash in the short term. And so we're going to be okay. And so we're going to price our, our therapy at $3 million, right? Um, why can you price it at $3 million? You're holding somebody's life at ransom. I mean, I think that's the way to, to think about it. You, it is 
you plunk down the money or else you die. I mean, that that is or or you go through immense suffering before you die. I mean, that's the that's the sort of choice. And so I think the right way to think about it is as a, as a sort of ransom payment, um, even if for, for a, even if you get something more valuable than just, you know, not having your personal details um, put out on the web or something. Yeah, if I can just add something there, I really do think that it's an important thing to appreciate that this is the problem of contemporary capitalism writ large. It isn't just a problem about this particular technology. And that's largely because we still bought into the idea that it's, you know, whatever the market will bear as contrasted with what is a decent profit. Um, you know, and I think we need to interrogate that because you could have a completely different way of thinking about this and sort of saying, yes, you've taken certain risks. Yes, you've done such and such an R&D. Yes, you're supposed to make a certain profit. But we have outrageous profits in, in many sectors. And I think, you know, we need to we need to think about this in its broader context. I, one of the moments that I found most poignant and also most compelling um, was when a, a sort of patient advocate from uh, India, a sickle cell patient advocate from India, um, whose name is Gautam Dongre, um, commented that that most that many people in India can't access um, hydroxyurea, which is like an old, cheap therapy. Ten, you know, ten pills for a dollar apparently is the going rate in India. Um, and here we have, you know, these emerging technologies which promise that well the initial initial high costs will reduce because technology always gets cheaper over time etc sort of doubling down on a system of innovation that you know is not disconnected i think francois from those larger systemic problems related to healthcare that you're talking about i mean if we invest in curing disease instead of you know treating disease with the sort of the sort of inadequate the the middling therapies of the moment i mean in this country, there is a sort of mode of doing, doing, you know, health-related welfare by investing in the future rather than in the present. And this is an investment in the future. And the the therapeutic possibilities coming out of out of somatic genome editing, et cetera, are going to be very significant. But they are also going to be extremely expensive if this is the trajectory that we follow. And people will basically have to choose between between coughing up the money or or you know living with and potentially dying with disease. Yeah, it's, so I a, feel it's like a serious problem. There, is, there are these two really quite amazing ambitions that many of us in the sort of ethics SDS type community have for gene editing, which is one, that it will be a moment to rethink these systems of delivery of therapies and development of therapies that it's like this moment to rethink that which is you know a huge ambition for this as you said that's not like this is a brand new problem it's just that here's another moment to really kind of raise it and see can we do be diff do different work here can we have different outcomes in terms of access but then there's this other kind of ambition which is that we will be able to have a kind of societal consensus or rethink around whether to do one of the other things that this technology might enable, which is this um, heritable. So I'm bringing us kind of back now to the sort of heritable um, issue. And, and that's also a really ambitious goal, right? That we would not just do let countries decide or let scientists innovate on this, and, and but we would actually engage a broader a huge swath of humanity in considering the, the questions. And so I, I want to raise, the, sort of come back to that, the heritable element of this and the idea of a societal consensus, which is, you know, Francois noted was like really prominent in the first um, summit and then kind of immediately a bit diluted by the second one. But like, I know it's an idea that you're still really committed to. So how can we, that's a, it's an ambitious goal as well, right? Reaching that kind of consensus on this particular application of the technology. So let me say a couple of things. So I remain committed to the idea of broad societal consensus. And since 2015, I have written a number of articles trying to unpack what that could mean. Um, and one of the things that I say very clearly and repeatedly is that a commitment to broad societal consensus is not about unanimity. It's about unity. It's not that everyone got to speak or say something. It's an agreement that all ideas were on the table. And so I think already, if you start thinking about what are the conditions for this kind of conversation, I think it makes sense in the abstract. 
for me, I can say, honestly, my challenge, and it's why I keep working on this concept, is how do I upscale it? Because I know that we do this kind of consensus decision making all the time. We do it in our, you know, um, families. We do it in our church groups. We do it in our classrooms. We do that in order to be able to work and live together. It's a huge problem to scale that up to the world in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean it's impossible. So for me, what's really frustrating is the ways in which people just put up barriers to say, it can't be done, it can't be done, crazy idea. And I have two responses to that. Um, one of them is to say, it's not a crazy idea at all. We in fact have lots of evidence that this can be done. And the simplest one, which connects up directly to this area is the 14 day rule for human embryo research, right? So some countries have that in legislation, other countries have it in guidelines. Some countries have nothing but the members of their scientific community who wish to be able to be published or to participate in certain kinds of international fora understand that that's a demarcation line. Now, Many people may know that demarcation line is currently under threat, right? Meaning people want to change it and it may well change. It may well change quickly, right? The fact that it changes has nothing to do in terms of undermining the fact that for 40 plus years, we had a consensus about this. So I get really frustrated when people say, no, 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 we can't have a consensus. And then they turn around and talk about the 14 day rule as an example of a consensus. I would go further. We actually have a consensus right now that you should not do heritable human genome editing. We just don't say that out loud. We can't say that. We just keep saying, well, it's not permissible at this time. Well, what does that mean? That means we have a consensus that you shouldn't do this. And then you add on at this time, which is what sort of for some people becomes really critical. But if you were to actually put that into grammar, they would say you don't need the at this time. If you say it remains unacceptable, it's clearly at this time. That's the time that you're saying it. So my first thing is to say, it clearly is possible to have a consensus on something. Now, can we have it in this area in a way that would be thought of as sustainable? Maybe, maybe not. But my second point that I insist upon is we will all be better off for having tried, right? Because what consensus building asks of you as a participant in that exercise is to listen to other people with respect and to hope that they too will listen to you with respect to understand what are their cares and concerns and to try to be respectful and to struggle along, right? And that's what we do all the time when we commit to consensus building. And I am, and I remain frustrated that some people think out of hand, we just have to put it aside. Why? We have evidence that it can happen and we will all be better off for trying even if we don't succeed in this particular instance. Thank you, Francoise. Do you have anything on that, Ben? I think it's really, that was really clear. Yeah, I mean, just that I, I tend to agree with most of the things that Francois says. <laughs> I'm going to agree with this one too. But but it, uh, sort of, um, I, I guess, uh, affirm something even more deeply and then disagree on one um, little point. So first of all, I absolutely agree that the process of seeking after consensus is, in a sense, um, the, the result to a large degree. Those processes of deliberation that invite in perspectives that would otherwise not be there, that shift the frame, that that you know, enrich a kind of sense of what's at stake and thereby engender humility, hopefully, amongst those who have um, who at the start of that process enjoy a position of particular influence. Um, that is an important result in itself. And I think one of the things that we underappreciate in this domain, we think that it's about technology, but really it's about our modes of contending with uh, our own projects and emerging capacities, technological and otherwise, for transforming human life, including social life. Uh, and the, the, the efforts to transform social life in a positive direction by engaging in um, robust forms of deliberation around these questions, that's only for the good. Um, the res what results from these processes is not just a policy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a technology, but ways of approaching governance, right? That have a kind of staying power, a stickiness, a durability. Um, so I think appreciating that matters. Furthermore, um, if one approaches it in that way, consensus is not a question of, you know, answering a yes, no question vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular technology. There, there are all sorts of intermediate forms of consensus, indeed about what kinds of questions need to be asked about in what terms they need to be asked um, through what fora with what kind of, of um, you know, sort of persistent openness versus moments of resolution and closure. I mean, these are, these are intermediate forms of consent, but that seems to me actually where the, where the action is. Um, 
And the one thing that I'll disagree with that Francois said is the at this time, that the at this time is a sort of, a, you know, a little addition that can easily just be chopped off the end and then we would have a have a consensus. I think the at this time is actually doing an enormous amount of work um, in terms of foreclosing the possibility of making precisely the kind of judgment, Francoise, that you suggested. Because at this time, which is interchangeable with premature, suggests a kind of natural process of maturation, of technological maturation, which is also in some sense linked to an idea of how these questions should be asked and when they should be asked. And if the if it doesn't mature to a point where it would be usable, why on earth do we need to have some sort of consensus about whether it should be used or not used? That is tightly coupled to the notion that once it has matured to a point where it is usable, there's no point in, in having a consensus about whether or not it should be used because it's inevitable that it will be used. I mean, that seems to me to be the just ubiquitous double move that is it, that is one of the sort of prime movers, one of the, the regulative frames um, that shapes the conversation in this domain. And I think it goes back to that kind of allocation of real estate, even in the context of the summit, the, the sort of you know, sovereign position of science that does what it's going to do and produces the capacities that it's going to produce that that perhaps then invite questions from the rest of society about whether it it wishes to to uh, um, you know deploy or constrain the deployment of those technologies already produced. It does not invite of the question what kind of research is good in the name of what collective goods to what what aspirations to the good inform the directions that this project of scientific research uh, uh, reflects and uses as its, as its guiding light. Yeah, so I want to I want to be clear. I do think that the at this time is doing work. I didn't mean to suggest it wasn't doing work. I was making the point that it's grammatically not required. And so the fact that it is there is something we should pay attention to. And it is what provides some people with comfort because they think they're saying one kind of a thing as contrasted with another kind of a thing. So if, yes. If you can if you can get people to drop that, I'm all for it, Francois. <laughs> but I but my, <laughs> <On> my lifetime. <laughs> but my, but else, my sense that project. My sense is so, that it's that it's a power move. It's about holding open a future. Um, it's it, and it's sort of delimiting. It's it's rendering less significant the the uh, the the views that are held, the feelings that are held in the present. Those are just temporary. Those are incomplete. Those are themselves immature. So we've actually tackled a couple of the questions that I saw in the Q and A in the chat, which is like, what does this mean, societal consensus, and also. Um, you know, are we assuming that this is all going to turn out to be benevolent, you know, safe and effective and we're going to go for it? And I think those were some of that were some of the um, sort of in the questions here. But Danny, do you want to um, put another a few a um, couple other questions sort of in front of us? I know we um, have quite a few. Yes, definitely. There's a lot of great questions. One is building on this idea of consensus. An attendee asks, one of the things that we've learned during COVID is that if all ideas are on the table, we are going to get some widely divergent ideas. So does societal consensus really mean that all ideas need to be respected? Or is there some other filter that ought to be applied? So um, as I said, I've spent a fair bit of time now writing and thinking about this. Um, and just a plug for the book, I have a whole chapter on consensus building in the book Altered Inheritance. And one of the things that I talk about there is you're trying to start off by getting all the ideas on the table, but you know that not all the ideas are going to be endorsed in some way, shape or form. So that's the start or the beginning of the process, if you will. I think what then becomes important is to think through what it means to participate responsibly in conversation. So there's two things I would highlight here. The first thing is if you're going to try genuinely to participate in any kind of a consensus building exercise, you have to have humility. And that means you have to genuinely believe you are not the smartest person in the room. It is not the case that you already have the answer and you're going into this conversation simply to persuade other people. It must be possible that in theory, you could learn from something someone said. So that's a, a first thing. And that in theory, everybody has to be willing to do. So you're going in with an open mind, willing to learn. That in and of itself for some people will be very hard. 
Beyond that, though, one of the things I talk about is if you're genuinely committed to this kind of an exercise, another part of that has to do with responsibility. So not just humility, but responsibility. And what I talk about there is if all ideas are on the table, it means that your idea has been discussed. Your idea has been debated. And in that context, you reach a point where if you've explained it many, many times, and people have said, I have heard you many, many times, and they're saying, we can't endorse that view. At some point, that view comes off the table. And then part of being responsible is being able to acknowledge, I have had my turn. I have had my say. I have not been able to persuade, persuade sorry. And it's just possible that, that on this issue, I am wrong. And so I actually withdraw. I don't keep, you know, fighting. Now, there are ways in which it gets much more complicated. I talk about the importance of struggle and what that means. So I'm not asking for people to lay down and, and give up on the things they believe. Um, you know, and I, I talk a lot here about integrity, integrity preserving compromises. I mean, I think it's actually a really interesting um, you know, way of trying to unpack this. And I will say other people are trying to do this work. So recently I, you know, I had an opportunity to meet and read some of Joy Zhang's work and she's talking about this in the context of commenting. And she has reason to believe, and I don't disagree with her, that maybe that language would be more inclusive and that people would be easier able to think about a commitment to commenting, to looking for what we have in common. I mean, it's much more sophisticated than that, but I'll let her present her own work. Um, but I think that's really what I'm talking about. It's finding a new way to have a conversation where people are not coming in, uh, as we would say in French, participe, that they're already deeply committed and the work of other people is to shift them. And I want people to come in, not having everybody else having to commit to shift, but you coming in willing to be shifted, willing to think that there's something I can learn here. Danny, you want to put another question out? I, I, there was one that I saw that about governance that I thought might be helpful, but for us to oh, discuss. you should go ahead and you can ask it, Josie. Okay, so um, there was a question in the Q and A, and I know some. I think some the audience can't see the Q and A, but um, there was a uh, a really good question about like suppose we can get some kinds of consensus how do, what what would governance look like what would global governance look like and um so I wanted to yeah I know I don't know if that's a topic that came up for the observatory um in the observatory satellite meetings um, someone else also noted that there were all these satellite meetings that happened around the the summer so and one of them was the global observatory so yeah I'd love to just hear some responses to that question about governance and global governance Ben do you want to maybe start um yeah so i i guess i am disinclined to uh say what the singular design principles of the institution or institutions that would do the governing should be um i think that we are that is that is also putting the cart before the horse uh that the where that we have deficits it's in the the forms of capacity for fostering and not just fostering but sustaining um, and drawing from and consolidating from the kinds of deliberation that Francois just described. Um, instead, we have, you know, a, a, an institution that understands itself as a kind of international or placeless institution, namely science. Um, and we have its sort of spin-off formations like professional scientific societies that do that in effect set policy they call them guidelines but they have a kind of transcendent position um that that you know is supposed to touch down in different jurisdictions and sort of be adopted as the most informed and the most up-to-date and etc cetera, etc cetera. um i mean i i think that the, that there are that those are problems that have to be overcome, not by putting in place some kind of structure um, to which we then invite the relevant stakeholders and have the process, the consensus conference that puts forward the, the policy or whatever. I, it seems to me that the questions around human genome editing, broadly conceived, I personally actually reject the somatic germline distinction as some sort of fundamental metaphysical distinction that needs to be respected. Um, I think that those that this is a domain that's important precisely because it quickly and easily draws to the surface um, questions about and for humanity that are not going to go away, and are and 
it, it is not as though this is a moment in the history of biotechnology that where they will pop up and then they will settle back down. Rather, um, it's the sort of tip of a much larger iceberg that we are going to be contending with, you know, decades, centuries, et cetera. And the commitments made now will have profound ramifications of a sort that we can't see further down the line. So, so to me, the most important step is sort of recognizing the nature of the problem, which is not a nature of governing the technology of the moment, but, but committing to the creation of, the fostering of, and the sustainability of um, those fora through which the kinds of deliberation that Francois is describing are invited, encouraged, um, and have a perpetual in guiding and governing um, our technological future. That is a sense the spirit in which the observ the global observatory project is undertaken um, to do pretty simple things like convene unconventional conversation partners, people who might not otherwise find themselves in the room in a room together, but both have things to say, and thereby can through kind of encounter and juxtaposition engender the sort of humility that Francoise was talking about. Uh, it's it's asking whether we're asking the right questions. What other questions could be asked? What happens to the deliberation if a different agenda is set, if a different starting point becomes the starting point? To not begin with technology, but to begin with ways of valuing the human, including the deficiencies that we have in the ways of valuing human life um, that govern us, and ask whether those deficient ways of governing are the ways we want to govern the development of these technologies, which do have the potential for profound impact and transformation, right? Including the reinscription of of unjust, of misguided, of deficient, of deficient ways of of governing ourselves, of of aspiring to make people better, right? Um, so, so uh, to me, the institutional answer, the institutional design answer, is necessarily heterogeneous. It's necessarily multi-scalar, from the level of the local all the way up to the level of the international. There's no singular place where the problem is going to be solved. There's no singular discourse in which it's going to be solved. There's no singular moment at which a resolution will be achieved, and then everything can go forward, and we can be done with this societal consensus nonsense and get on with the science, as people, as our as our scientific colleagues will often in moments of honesty say. Um, uh, I, I think that that is a, you know, that that sort of orientation is fundamentally contradictory to the kind of deliberative project that Francoise was describing. So we I don't have very many minutes, but I want to give you, Francois, sorry, I want to give you the last, I think probably the last word on uh, on this, even though there are all these other questions about enhancement that have, and various other tech things that haven't, we haven't got to, but Francois, and then I will I'll have to close. Sure. So let me just offer uh, two quick comments. Uh, the first one is to say that in the context of the work that I did with WHO, part of what we tried to do in that um building of a framework, if you will, for governance, because we were responding to our charge from the Director General, was to actually try to broaden that concept so that people don't think of governance just in terms of things like legislation, guidelines, codes of ethics, et cetera, but that we really think of it, about it more broadly. So, you know, the patent system is a form of governance, uh, you know, and we could call that into question. Um, you know, journal policies are a form of governance and we could think about that. Quite frankly, the education of young scientists is a form of governance. And so in that work, there's an effort to try to say, why don't we start problematizing what we think counts as governance? So that's the first comment. The second one, and I, it's, I'll just offer it up in the context of, you said there were questions about enhancement, which we haven't got to. Different people, draw a big distinction between therapy good, enhancement bad. I don't accept that. And in fact, in the book, I talk very much about why, in fact, just the therapy enhancement distinction doesn't work. But a phrase that I find helpful in this regard for people to think about is the difference between making people better and making better people. And I think that there's something really important if we use that lens to interrogate what it is that we're doing and in terms of what is it that we are pursuing? What is it that we think is the good in that context? So I think there is still work to be done, but I don't think it's this neat divide between therapy and enhancement. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry to have to end the conversation. Honestly, I feel like there are, are more questions that we could discuss and we certainly won't drop this topic. Um, the Hastings Centre will, I'm sure, have another 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 session of some kind on this quest these questions. Um, you know, 
at a future date. Um, but I just wanted to thank Francoise and Ben for their for joining us, for sharing their thoughts, for like being willing to distill things into um, you know uh, fewer words than than we all than than we like to be able to have, and to our audience for um, their questions um, and for for joining us. And um, pass it back to Danny. So thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. Like we said earlier in the event, there will be a recording available later today with closed captioning and other accessibility features. Thank you.